proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell him all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. Would you please stand with us as we sing praise this morning?
And we gather for many reasons. For some, it, it's something we've done for so long that we don't know what else we would do if we weren't gathered together on a Sunday morning. For some, we've gathered because we have heavy burdens on our heart and we need to be in the presence of God and God's people. Father, we gather together because we're looking for something, searching for something, hoping for something, and that draws us here to your word, to your people, to one another, and to the community. Father, we, we, we gather together because this is what your people do. This is who we are. Because we know and we have learned and we continue to learn that the life of faith, the life of a Jesus follower is not a life meant to be lived alone. And so the burdens that we carry on our hearts, the, the anxieties, the stresses, the fears, whether spoken or unspoken, the requests that are, are written on our prayer request sheet or uh, ones that we aren't even brave enough to vocalize. We bring all of that with us this morning. And we bring it to you and to the community of believers that you have gathered here and called uh, Battle Creek First Church. There's nothing special specifically about a building, about these seats, about these pews. And yet, there is something special about this place where your people gather, where we know one another's names, where we know what each other have wrestled with and what they've struggled with, and, and the successes we've shared together as well. And so we're gracious and humble that as your people we are invited together. We are drawn to one another. And the barriers that are between us, the stumbling blocks, the, the differences of opinions and thoughts that can cause some conflict or violence at time, we are so grateful that your spirit moves in there and, and works to resolve and move those so that your church may be a witness to the world. But just because people are different, just because people have different ideas about things, doesn't mean that we can't be family. Doesn't mean that there can't be peace. The goal is not for everyone to be alike. The goal is for everyone to be in you. And so we thank you. And we love you. You're a good and loving father. Give something to pray. Today's scripture reading is Philippians 1, 21 through 31. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor, labor for me. Yet what should I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between these two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with you all, with you all for your progress and the joy of faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will be will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come to see you or only to hear you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the Spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way to those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but, what will, or but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but to suffer for him. Since you are going through going through the same suffering struggle I saw you or you saw I had, and now hear that I still have.
be disposed of. So that was <laughs> that was the scramble. Um, but yeah, so I appreciate Tabitha coming in and sharing your scripture. I the older I get, the more that I am involved with church, the more value and the more I sense a need for the public reading of scripture. And so this is something that, that we're going to try and incorporate in uh, a little bit more into our, our services of, uh, beyond the scripture that we're <coughs> going to study for the sermon or look at for a sermon text. Um, most weeks we'll have an additional scripture reading that, that kind of connects in um, with the sermon and then in addition to what Pastor Hannah or somebody on the worship team will share, usually a, a psalm that connects in. So um, I, I think we as Christians would do well to have Scripture kind of wash over us and work its way into our lives. And so, um, and what I've come to realize is that we're such busy people, uh, and, and life is so crazy and chaotic that the minute you walk out the store, there's noise and there's stuff to do and there's people needing your attention stuff. So, I'm like, well, I'll just make sure you get plenty of Scripture here. So, that's what's going to happen. Um, but this morning, it, it's good to be with you. Uh, I really appreciate Pastor Will coming very last minute last week and, and stepping in and preaching. Um, I felt awful. Uh, it was something that I wouldn't wish on anybody, but it came and passed. Um, I'll look back relatively quickly, and I feel much, much better. Thank you for all the prayers and concern and all of that. Um, but for, for the past several weeks, we've been asking this question as we look around the world around us and, and see all the challenges and the struggles and, and the questions and the, the divisiveness and the conflicts we ask the question, what, what's a church to do, right? Do we just jump right in? Do we just go along with the flow? Do we step out altogether and say, oh, we'll just let the world destroy itself and we'll just kind of hide out over here? Like, what's a church to do? And this week we're going to answer that question by looking at one of my favorite scriptures. Again, I say this every week, so you should get used to this. Uh, one of my favorite scriptures is the story of Jonah. Um, it's one of my favorites, uh, although... Um, just to help some people out. Um, it doesn't rank high enough, high enough up for me to name my son after. Some people are like, oh, oh Jonah. No, it's Jonas. So, um, <laughs> it's funny when we were, when Jonas was, was originally born, and, uh, not to be, anyway, um, uh, we were pastoring another church, and people came up to us like, we knew you'd pick a biblical name. I'm like, yeah, Jonas isn't quite in the Bible. Um, <laughs> But anyway, uh, Jonah is, is such a great story because it reveals something about the people of Israel, but it reveals something about us as we walk through it. Um, it's a tough story. So in fact, if you, if you can get a high enough view, if you can step away from some of the, the interesting details that may draw our attention, if you can step back far enough, you can actually see that Jonah is the story of Israel, God's people, who've been called to be priests to the world and called to bless those around them and bless the world. It's, it's the story of those people, but with a prophetic ending, with, with the end in sight. So uh, I won't be able to explain that until I tell you the story. The book of Jonah is just four chapters. Uh, it's a short story. It'll probably take about 10, 15 minutes to read straight through. There's not a whole lot of details. It gets right to the point. It moves quickly, and then it's over. Um, and if you're looking for a happy, feel-good ending, uh, Jonah's not your story. For that. Um, it ends very abruptly. Um, but the story of Jonah is the story of a, a man named Jonah that God calls. Right? And, and so this is a, a man that, that God says, hey, I, there's a city of Nineveh, which is the capital of, of Assyria, which is like the worst of the worst people. Right, from, the, from the Israel's perspective. These were the enemies. These were the, the, the bad guys. These were the most ungodly people. These were a great military force that eventually comes and conquers uh, several of the tribes, conquers half of the country of Israel. These were people that the people of Israel would have looked at and said, those are our enemies at the deepest level. They stand for everything that we're against. They represent everything that, that we're against, and they're the most ungodly people, and they're just right up the road, and they're a threat to our, our lives and our way of life. And God comes to Jonah and says, I have a message. I want you to take this message to the heart of that empire, 
to the capital city, to this Nineveh, and say, in 40 days, the city will fall, unless you change your ways. Call the city to repentance. Go into the heart of this ungodly, pagan empire and say, judgment is coming because of the way you live. So this is the calling that God put on Jonah's life. And Jonah promptly walks out the door after hearing this call and runs in the exact opposite direction. He didn't want to go do this. He gets on a ship, and, and if, if Nineveh was to the east, he, ship, he sailed straight west. And while he's on this, this, this ship, a storm comes up, right? Many of us are familiar with this. We've been to Sunday school or heard the story. Um, the storm comes up. Well, well, Jonah is on board, and these, these sailors are wondering what is going on. And because it's a storm unlike they had seen before, Jonah says, oh, this is, this is my fault. Throw me over. Because God's angry at me. I, I serve a God that is not only God of the land, but of God of the sea. And this would have been foreign to these sailors. They weren't just uh, Israeli uh, sailors. They, they weren't part of the people of God. And so their gods would have been gods of very specific things. There's God of the sea, God of a harvest, God of fertility, God of whatever. Like they would have had kind of the, the pantheon of different beliefs and different things. But Jonah gets on this boat, and in the middle of this crazy storm, he tells these sailors, my God is the God of the land, the God of sea, the God of everything. And he's mad at me because I'm being disobedient. So throw me over. And the, the story goes on, and it's such an interesting moment in the story that when, when Jonah finally convinces these, <laughs> these men to toss him over, as he's sinking down, it says that the, the sailors were afraid of this God and believed. <laughs> um, Jonah was afraid of this God, and he wanted to run away. But the sailors were afraid of this God, and they believed. So they came to faith. In, this, in Jonah's God because of this. But as, as Jonah is sinking down into the depths, into the pits, into the dark, chaotic waters of the sea, God's not done with him yet. <laughs> he hasn't accomplished the mission yet. Um, and so, like I said, this is the story of Jonah is the story of Israel. So even though Jonah isn't being obedient, even though he's running in the opposite direction, he's not doing what God would have him to do, uh, God still has a plan to work with this mess. Right? <laughs> Not done yet. So this is kind of the story of Israel. As it said, no to God time and time and time again. He doesn't give up on them. Right? So it, it, it parallels. But so God sends this fish. And this, this fish swallows up Jonah. It doesn't say it's a whale. It's a fun story. Or that's Pinocchio. Um, that's a totally different, totally different thing. It says it's a fish that swallows him up. In three days, he, he spends in this fish coming up from the depths. And the fish spits him up on dry land. And lo and behold, he's right where he was supposed to be all. The shores uh, of the land on the way to Nineveh. And so, what's the prophet to do? And so he, he heads in at this point, like, he's like, I might as well just go deliver this message. So he starts heading into the city of Nineveh, which the city was so large that on foot it would have taken probably three days to work their way from the outer wall of the city into the center part. So it, it, it wasn't just a, well, I, I'll drop in and head out real quick. But this was a journey that he had to, and I could just hear Jonah every step of the way, grumbling, unhappy to be there. This is not what I want to be doing. Complaining about a fish ride, right? Like, I mean, this has not been a good day for Jonah. And he gets to the middle uh, of the city, and he declares his message which in Hebrew is just, it's either four or five words is what he says. It's a really brief, like, it'd be one of those moments where, where you tell your kids to do something and they do the bare minimal possible and then look at you like, see, I did it, right? Like, go put your dishes in the sink and then I throw it in the sink on the other side of the room or something. Like, Jonah gets there and he says a, a, a four or five word message that basically says, in 40 days, your city's destroyed, right? And he was hoping to be able to walk into the city, check the box, say, I did what I was supposed to do, now I can go on with my life. But something weird happens. Despite his, his lack of effort, despite his desire not to be there, despite his, his, his 
lack of enthusiasm for the message, it's received by the people. If you read in, in, the, in, the, in the book of Jonah, you'll see that, that it says they, they received it, they heard it, and they repented. They believed and they changed their ways. And, and this message made it all the way up to the king who made a royal de a decree that we were going to change our ways as a city. So it, Jonah's message lands after all. He doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to do this. He doesn't want to go to these people. He doesn't really want to spend a whole lot of time explaining his message, and so he doesn't. But the message lands. The message is heard. There's people that have heard God through Jonah, despite his lack of <laughs> obedience. And so Nineveh, this, the Bible tells us, is spared. There's this, this great part of chapter 3 come to an end that talks about God uh, bringing forgiveness and redemption to these people that were enemies of God and of Israel. There's this, this story, of, uh, uh, in, as chapter 3 wraps up, that the message has, has been received and life has been changed and the whole kingdom has come to know God. And it sounds like such a great great story, right? Like if this was us, we'd be like, let's have a parade, let's throw out the celebration. Like, this is good news. The message of, of God has been heard and people have changed their lives and people have been... Been, been saved by this message. It's such good news. But this is where our scripture for today picks up. At this point in the story, right after Nineveh has been saved, we're going to look at, at Jonah chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 11, which is the whole fourth chapter. But right after <laughs> this good event, we would think, of Nineveh coming to repentance and faith. The scriptures tell us. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate, God. Slow to anger, abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter. He sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plan. <laughs> but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed on the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. And said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about this plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for this great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? And also, many animals. And that's our scripture reads this morning. That's the word of the Lord for the people of God. God, pray with me. Well, Father, we are grateful for the story of Jonah. We're grateful that we see that you have been calling people for a very long time. And Jonah is an example of somebody who has wrestled with this calling and didn't get it right and struggled with what he was supposed to do and the people he was supposed to serve and, 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 and all of that. In fact, he tried to run away from you, Lord. And this simple short story reminds us that there's no place that we can go where you are not already there. Whether it be in the belly of a fish deep, deep underwater, you are there. 
whether it be in the city of Nineveh, in the midst of our enemies, in the midst of the most ungodly people, and those people that we would, we would not look as one of our own, you're there at work already as well. Father, help us this morning to see through your eyes so that we may fulfill the calling that you have placed on each and every one of our lives and together as a church. We thank you and we love you. So, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a, a, a glimpse behind the scenes of what sermon writing for Pastor Tanner looks like. So most weeks I start with a, a template that I've, I've put together over the years, and there's some boxes at the top of this, this document. And it's uh, you know, a place for me to fill in what the scripture is I'm preaching from, and then I have one, one, one box that says the essence of the text, which is for me to wrestle with and summarize in one as clarified sentences as I possibly can. School teachers, this would be, you know, your your, your topic sentence or your, your you know, your, your thesis, right? Like this is, boiled down to the nuts and bolts, one strong idea, this is what the scripture text is about. And then underneath that, I have essence of the sermon. And so I do that same process, but wrestle through and try to boil down what is the one thing that I want to make sure this message communicates. Right? Underneath that, I have two boxes. And they both start with, uh, what I want you to, and then dot dot. And on one box it says, what I want you to know. And another box it says, what I want you to do. Right? Because like this is the way I'm, I'm approaching my sermon writing. Uh, I want to be able to clarify my ideas, and as I write, come back to these things. But always be in mind, what is something I want you to know? Like, what is this core thing that walking out the door, you go, oh, that's what the sermon was about. I don't want there to be any question. And so I start with that. Um, and, and same thing with what I want you to do, because the life of a Christian is a life of action, right? A response, a living faithful. And so I don't want there to be any doubt um, at the end of the, the sermon what those those things are. And so I start with that. And as I write, like my mind goes all different places, and there's so much good stuff about some of these scriptures and these stories. And so it's really easy for me to get off track. And so I come back. This this actually helps me. This is the reason why sermons aren't an hour long, right? So. Um, be grateful that I have these boxes. But <clears throat> many weeks, I never actually mention specifically what those things are in the boxes. I don't come right out and, and say, well, this is what I want you to do. Um, it's built kind of baked into the invitation of the way I wrap up my, my sermon. But, but this week, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of do something a little different. For some weeks, I, I, I will build towards that, and, and the, what I want you to know, I want you to do is kind of a big reveal. Like, we build a case, and then, ta-da, I want you to do this, right? But this week, I'm just going to come right out and tell you what I want you to know right at the beginning. And if you don't hear anything else the rest of the message, um, you've at least heard the message. And that is, and I think we have a slide for it, lost people matter to God. This is, what I, this is what's in my box, what I want you to know. Right? Lost people matter to God. Now, there's a lot of themes in this book of Jonah. There's a lot of things that we can, we can look at in this short book. Um, we can uh, talk about accepting or running away from our calling that God's calling us to do. Uh, you ever felt God calling you to do something you know that's not always a straightforward, well, sure, that's what I'd like to do, but there's usually some sort of wrestling with that. Um, so that could have been what Jonah was about. Or uh, it could be talking about the fear of the Lord, that Jonah ran away from God. Well, the sailors on the boats, they offered sacrifices and came to faith. Um, again, we could, we could be talking about that God is a God of land and sea. He's a God of all creation, and everything else is just idols and fall short. And like that could be a good theme from the book of Jonah. We could talk about three days in the fish, um, God's presence, God's grace, God's protection in difficult situations. Like I think that could have been a good a good message uh, off the story of Jonah. Um, we could talk about how God is going to judge the city of Nineveh, and so that that that. There's biblical scriptural evidence that you know God judges wicked deeds. That this is who our God is, and we can talk a lot about that. Um, Jonah could point us to talk about uh, the relationship between God's people being obedient and lost people hearing an invitation. Right? If Jonah didn't go to the city, then the people would have never heard. There's a connection between God's people being obedient to what they're called to do and lost people hearing the message. Right? 
So that would be, I, I think that's a really good message that we may circle back around at another point in time. Is that a, a good one? Um, we can talk about the relationship between repentance and salvation. Uh, both the sailors and the people of Nineveh, they changed their ways, they came faith, and they were saved from the calamity that was surely coming. Um, but the main theme of the story of God, or the story of Jonah, the main theme in this story is God's compassion and grace toward the city of Nineveh, which symbolizes and embodies the most ungodly people. Right? So that's where we're going to land today. God's compassion and grace towards the city of Nineveh. And so we've already said that lost people matter to God. God sent Jonah to call them to repentance, to be saved from certain destruction. If they continued living how they were, it was just going to end with judgment and destruction. And Jonah was mad. Jonah was mad at this calling, at this message, because he knew they would receive grace and forgiveness. He knew that the sinners, the enemies of Israel, the people who threatened God's people, would receive grace. As verse 1 in chapter 4 says, it seemed wrong to Jonah. This is the, the plot twist that I seemed to miss when I was younger studying this, this book of Jonah. I knew he didn't want to go. I, I knew he didn't want to go, but I never understood why. He says, it seems wrong that these people are going to receive grace. Now, I'm, I'm not a perfectionist, that's for sure. Like, I don't spend a tremendous amount of time or energy like, being perfectionist. And I'm definitely not obsessed with rule following. Like, that's not, I don't get caught up in like, legalistic Type of stuff. But I do see the value in the reasons behind the rules and processes and policies and, and manners and processes, right? Like, I, I see the, the reason behind these things. And so when the, uh, a car whips past you as you're driving down the highway, a car whips past you doing 20 miles an hour over the speed limit and is driving all reckless and crazy, they're probably on their phone, drink a cup of coffee, right? When they come flying by you and a few minutes later you see them pulled over on the side of the road, by a cop, right? I might smile a little bit, <laughs> right? Is there anything more satisfying than seeing people get what they deserve? Like you're, you're, you're reassured that the world is working the way that it's supposed to, right? He didn't get away with it. He thought he was above the rules. He thought he was better than me. Here I am doing my seven over the speed limit. <laughs> Apparently that's okay. Uh, Amen. <laughs> right. But is there anything more satisfying than seeing people get what they deserve? A, a cheater that gets caught. A, a bragger, somebody that's overly proud that gets humbled or humiliated. <coughs> like, isn't it fun to watch people fall? A lazy coworker who gets written up, right? I have to do all their work and nobody ever notices, and finally the boss catches on and they get written up. Right? Uh, a a two-faced person that gets caught in a lie, uh, Sometimes it just feels right to see people get what they deserve, the consequences for their behaviors, because bad choices lead to bad results, right? And sometimes it's just good to see that, that me trying to be a good person isn't going, you know, like if the world still notices, that there's still things that, there's consequences for the choices we make. It's hard to be the good guy sometimes, to do the right thing, and, and because it's hard to do those things, it's hard to watch other people take shortcuts. It's hard to watch other people um, get ahead by actually not caring about other people. It's hard to watch people get ahead and accomplish things by, by not caring about the things that you think are critical and core to your, who you are. It's hard to see our enemies succeed. But here's the hard lesson of Jonah. The hard lesson of Jonah is that God has more compassion and grace than we do. God has more compassion and grace than we do. That person that you can't stand right now. That I, I looked around the room, I wasn't looking anyway specifically. But, um, <laughs> the, the person that has hurt you, the person who thinks that they are better than you, or that person that makes you so angry you could scream. That person. God loves them. 
God cares about them. God wants them to know that they are loved, and God wants them to turn away from their sins and receive forgiveness, to receive grace, and be redeemed. God is more compassionate and gracious than we are. Jonah grew angry with God because God was slow to anger. God cared for the people that Jonah hated. God loved the unlovable and forgave the unforgivable. And that drove Jonah to despair. He said he wished he was dead because God was gracious to other people. Talk about dramatic. Without God's judgment on his enemies, he couldn't live. He didn't want to live. So, in order to see peace grow in our community and to see new people come to know God's salvation, we have to learn to celebrate grace, not grieve it. Jonah saw this tremendous event, this entire city, as the scriptures told us, 120,000 people and all their cows, which is what the scripture says, which apparently was important to throw in there. Um, <laughs> all the animals that were there. It's such a great way for a chapter to end, or a book to end, and all their animals too. But a city of 120,000 people was saved in this story. And Jonah grieved the grace given to them. Have you ever met those Christians who seemed a little bit too excited, too happy to tell people that they're going to hell? I'm not telling you excited to share the love of Jesus. I'm not telling you that they're excited to, to share the gospel. I'm not telling you to, about people that are excited to, to share that redemption and salvation is possible. No, no, not that. But people that are just in a conversation, in an argument, like they pull out the, the trump card, the magic nuclear button, of, well, you're going to hell, right? The type of Christians who, who maybe get a sense of victory or satisfaction, or maybe even people who celebrate the destruction of their enemies. The Bible tells us, and, and Paul referred to this, this scripture in Sunday school, uh, the Bible tells us it's not God's will for any to perish. So why is it the will of some of his followers? And we're back to the, the statement that we started with. Because God is more compassionate and gracious than you are. Lost people, hurting people, sick people, people who aren't like us matter to God. God is on a mission to seek and to save those who do not already know Him. And so if we're going to just call ourselves God's people, if we're going to say that God is our Father, God is our teacher, right? It means that we are taught by God how to live the way that God wants us to live. If we plan to be obedient to God and participate in the work that God is doing, right here in our communities, in our neighborhoods. And we have to learn to give grace, like God, and celebrate lives that have been transformed. Jonah didn't celebrate the redemption of Nineveh because he couldn't see his enemies as receiving grace from his God. As Christians, we can fall into the same trap we can look at the world out there and say, those are the people that are against us. But as a church, those are the people that we're trying to reach, is it not? Yes. The big thing on the wall, the paint on the wall says, go make disciples. I think of what it says, or something like that, go. That's the mission of this church. Well, we're not going to go make disciples of people that are already disciples. <laughs> we're going to go and reach those people that are outside of our camp with the good news and the grace that God has for them. So we have to learn to give grace like God and celebrate the lives that have been transformed. And when those moments occur, where we, like Jonah, feel that grace just seems wrong, and they will occur, it will happen. May God convict us of the pride that is the foundation for that feeling. There's a deep-seated pride that we, we may not even be able to acknowledge or see from our own perspective, but may God help us begin to see what's at work in our own hearts. Because the idea that they don't 
deserve what they get. The they, the them, those enemies out there. It usually starts with the idea that I do deserve the good things that I get. Right? It's, it's, a, it's the difference between earning a paycheck and being given a gift. We, we, we very quickly will announce that salvation isn't by anything that we do, but how quickly do we, we identify ourselves over and against other people by what we do or what they do? We create an us versus them by, by our behaviors, and then we, we say, well, they get the judgment, and we get it. That's on the back. Yeah. Another one of my favorite scriptures, again, they're all my favorites, so just, you're going to get used to that. Um, but Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son, we're familiar with that one. It's one of the most well-known stories in, that Jesus ever told. Um, two brothers and a dad. The younger brother goes to his, his dad and says, give me my inheritance. And he goes off and he squanders it. And asking that question is, is offensive to his father. It's, and it's not part of the way that the system done, so it, it, it offends his brother as well. And so his brother takes his inheritance. He goes off and he makes poor choice after poor choice until he's eating food that's meant for pigs. He's getting what he deserved, right? Like the system's working. You, you make poor choices and you get poor results. And so the son returns home to his father hoping just to get a job. Like, I know I can't be the son anymore. I know it won't be ever like it was before, but at least I can have a job. And when he gets home, the dad sees him at a distance and runs out and puts a ring on his finger, which means he's the son again. And they throw a party celebrating his return. And the older brother who, who, who just got his younger brother back does he celebrate the return? Thank God my, my brother has found his way home. He's quit making poor choices. And he can, be, he can be made right with the family again. No, the older brother is jealous. The older brother is frustrated. He says, I've been doing the right thing all along. Who, who, who is he to come back and get all this stuff? I've earned it. And the father says, it's all. It's all yours all along anyways. It's all a gift. It's all grace. It's all It's all here for you. Not because you've earned it. Not because you've done the right things. Or, or, or because he did the wrong things. It's not based off of what you've done. It's because I am a gracious father. And I have given you everything. God is more compassionate than we are. And this is a hard truth. Because we as Christians like to think of ourselves as good people. We like to think of ourselves as, 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 as loving people. As kind people. And we are. And... and I'm not picking on the bad first church. You guys have been amazingly gracious and wonderful and kind and loving as the Griffin family has become a part of your church family. And so I'm not come standing up and saying, well, you all are just, no. Like, that's not what this is. It's a reminder that no matter how gracious, how forgiving, how caring we are, that God is even more so. And that should shape and form who we are and who we want to become. In this era of divisive and uh, divisive rhetoric and, and manufactured rage, the world wants us to look at one another and pick up and throw rocks. It wants us to hate our enemies. But as a church, like, what's a church to do when we have enemies? God looks at them and says, that's a child of mine that's gone wayward. I want them to know that I love them. Who's going to tell them? And so, may we learn to give grace like God and celebrate lives that are transformed. God can transform lives. Let's learn to celebrate what people used to be and what they become because of who God is. I'm going to invite the praise team to come and lead us in uh, one more moment of worship. You can use this as a, as a moment to, to respond, to pray, to, to worship God, who is this gracious, loving God, who has extended grace and forgiveness to you, not because you've earned it, but because God.
God chose to love you. Pray with me for all. Father, your, your word tells us that Christ died for us even while we were yet sinners. It might make sense for Christ to die for a good guy, a good woman. For, for, for Jesus to be willing to sacrifice his life for a righteous person. But for somebody who was an enemy. Father, you're the, the model of love that we hope to emulate. You are more gracious and compassionate than you are. There are limits to our love. There are moments when, when fear or frustration or pride or insecurities say, well, that's enough. I've gone so far. But the cross of Jesus reminds us that even while they were nailing nails into his hand, he said, forgive them. Even when they were in the act of killing him, he would not call them enemy. Father, may our hearts and minds be shaped to be more like Jesus. There's something we pray this.